All right, well, welcome back um, to those of you who may have just joined us. Uh, next up, we have Paul Gardner-Steven talking about, well, his, his topic is from megalomania to prototype in four months, but a brief read of the description that sort of reads from megalomania to more megalomania. Uh, but I'll, I'll let him uh, explain about uh, the Serval uh, project he's been working on. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, welcome everybody, it's uh, great to be here and um, we'll just start with a, a little intro video to show some of what we've been up to, so just let me work the technology. Hello computer. Ooh. If they worked we wouldn't have a job would we? Anywhere, at yeah, any time. The That's the here. promise of a new mobile How phone that system that works in places where there's Someone no reception. Ah. Australian researchers have developed the technology and say it could help save lives in a disaster. They've gone all out just to prove a point. Researchers from Flinders University have come to Scylla's outlook in the Arkarula wilderness in South Australia's far north. It's a breathtaking spot for many travellers who want to get away from the world and drop out of contact. Here at Arkarula the nearest mobile phone coverage is probably 100 or 130 kilometres away. Um, there are places that we're visiting today where um, you know, we're in chasms and gorges where even a satellite phone would actually have a lot of trouble. It's no problem for a system that doesn't need towers or satellites. Each phone is fitted with software that allows them to talk to each other. Hello Danny, can you hear me? It's an adaptation of wireless internet technology. Instead of transmitting data over radio waves, it transmits voice. Out here, conventional mobile phones are useless, but with this new system, it's easy to make a call. Hello Paul, how'd the test go? Hi Jason, yeah the test has been 100% successful. So far the system's range is limited to a few hundred metres. It can be boosted with small transmitters. The researchers believe the system could eventually help in natural disasters or emergencies when communications go down. You could have a, you know, a Hercules or a similar um, aircraft overfly in the immediate hours after a disaster and drop perhaps a hundred or even a thousand of these units because again they're very cheap and really provide a, a very effective um, telecommunications network. For now they're happy they've been able to set up a connection where there was none. Jason Om, ABC News, Arkarula. Okie dokie. Let's jump back to the presentation. Um, we'll talk about a little bit more, more about that in a moment, but... Uh, yeah. um, first, ads. Um, I'll be talking about this project um, in two further talks. This afternoon I'll be talking about the actual technology that we're using. Whereas today I really wanted, to, this morning I wanted to tell a, the story about how we went from not even having an idea to having an idea to kind of getting to this crazy place and uh, convincing a university to pay several thousand dollars so I could charter a jet, fly to the outback and do a test with a media crew that we could have done in the, uh, the university car park. Um, <laughs> and uh, the media as a, uh, an alternative to um, conventional publication. And then the main talk they'll actually be doing is on Thursday, um, where we'll actually be talking in more detail about kind of the big picture of its usability. And then hopefully we'll have a, a big helium balloon outside um, somewhere at lunchtime and we'll actually demonstrate how um, the system could actually be used, you know, even here and now in, uh, in Queensland and the other states with the, uh, the flooding uh, problem. So let's get underway. Just a very quick overview of what, uh, what we've done. And as I say, this will be covered in more detail in the other presentations. Uh, we have mobile phones meshing, uh, running Android, and we actually can have phones connect to the 3G data network and to the mesh. So that you can have uh, mesh phones in somewhere where there's no coverage, maybe there should actually be some water here perhaps, showing that it's got damp feet. Um, and we could actually re-establish communications in that dead area um, via a nearby cell which is actually still operating. So clearly there's a whole pile of uh, applications for this technology. But really what I want to talk about is the process that we've gone through. Um, when I actually had this idea after the Haiti earthquake last year, um, I was effectively a sysadmin at Flinders University, uh, which meant that I had a day job, um, which meant that I had, I had one day a week, uh, if you like, my 20% time that I'd managed to, to get through the university to do research, um, which was largely chewed up in paperwork and other things. Um, but I thought, okay, we've got this fantastic idea. So, um, how are we going to do it with no time, with no money and all of that kind of thing? And um, you know, my wife was pregnant and having bad morning sickness and it was uh, not an ideal time. 
um, and to have no resources. But I thought, no, this is an idea that can change the world, and, and not just for disaster relief. You think of connecting the last two billion people. If we can make meshing phones work so that, you know, I mean, these are already actually second-hand phones off eBay, but when they're third-hand, when we're finished with them, or when you guys finish with your smartphones, you know, basically take them into a developing country, and uh, they are the phone network. You know, they can actually start enjoying uh, the freedom of calls, and of course it's all over VoIP, so they actually have internet access potentially as well. So I thought, okay, how on earth am I going to, to fund all of this? So I thought, okay, I like my vintage computer collection. I had a, a Commodore 65 prototype, one of about 50 in the world, which I was very fortunate to get. Um, sold that for um, a surprising amount of money, actually. Um, and also, how many here in the, the university sector? I presume reasonable number, like as students and things as well. Um, who's ever tried to get a research grant out of a university or the government? <laughs> Um, how much time and effort does it take compared to um, six minutes and getting $1,000 six days later? Um, if you're doing awesome work and have an awesome idea, look up the Orgson Foundation and, um, and stick a grant in. It will take six minutes and you might get a phone call from Boston six days later. Um, and if you can actually get to Boston, they'll even give you a big check with $1,000 written on it. So it's, um, it's just good all around. Um, so I decided, okay, we're going to do this. Got $1,000 to actually buy the first few handsets. Um, and then basically I was working 80 hour weeks for four months uh, with a, a research student. Um, I don't regret what we've achieved out of it, but it was not a fun time. Um, fortunately, as students, hopefully you can actually have the, the luxury of working full time on these things to some degree, but this is the reality of what's gone on. So we got close to having a, a working prototype of being able to do mesh calling. We thought, okay, how do we do this? You know, as I say there, do we publish respectably in a peer-reviewed journal and go the normal course of academia and maybe in 15 years time someone might read it and you know, we might get a couple of citations and we go, oh that's all wonderful and good. Or do we want to change the world? Um, which meant dealing with that thing which is uh, generally not well respected in universities for the most part, which is to publish in the media. Um, and you've seen that the two minute clip uh, that came out of that. And I've actually had a little bit of previous experience with publishing in the media as well. And you know, the simple line is actually that it works. Um, it depends on the outlet. The ABC is probably better than some of the other stations for this kind of thing in terms of perceived credibility. What was really interesting is that TV actually isn't the best. If you want to get attention of the people who make decisions in a country, um, here in Australia, um, go on the Radio National AM program. Um, and you know, you'll get calls from the Defence Signals Directorate and all sorts of really interesting things. Because um, kind of think about what spooks might care about what we're doing. So. Um, yeah, I've got some academic publications as well, but none of those have actually had any tangible good for what I've tried to do in research. The media, on the other hand, has been great. Um, New Inventors is also a fantastic one to get on. Um, when I was filming with them uh, with this project, uh, they were saying, oh, you know, just kind of casually, like, you know, 1.3 million people a week watch the New Inventors. Um, I suspect there are probably not many researchers in the world who actually end up with 1.3 million people reading their papers. Um, let alone actually paying attention for seven minutes while you get to actually say what you really care about the project rather than just you know, explaining the weird things that the peer reviewers actually wanted you to explain. So I guess I'm encouraging you to, to think more broadly than the traditional approach to publication. Oh yes, and universities, um, academically, the media, oh no, 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 terrible. Um, but the university's marketing departments, media, oh, very nice indeed. Um, when we did that trip to Arcarola, at that point the university had contributed zero dollars to the research. Um, they had, however, contributed three thousand dollars to chartering a jet plane to fly to the outback, um, and then another six hundred dollars came out of another bucket, um, and a whole pile of things suddenly became easy because we were doing a marketing exercise. Marketing purse strings are much looser, and the success criteria are beautifully vague. Um, this isn't to say that you, you go out to scam the media, because you don't, because uh, it's actually it's a win-win situation for it to work. But you know, a successful media event is one that happens. Um, it's like saying that you know, a successful publication is one that gets published rather than actually read, cited, and being in a decent journal, and you, know, you could just sit there and print it out on your printer at home and glue it together and put it in the library, and that would be deemed success. Um, in comparison, that's how easy media is. Although there are some challenges in terms of um, thinking about how you actually get the media to engage. Cultural reference is actually a really good thing, as well as obviously relevance. Um, so the previous work that I did was actually um, 
shoe phone. Um, no one had made a real working shoe phone before. Um, yeah, exactly. And um, if I could get the jolly thing to... The, uh, you have to pair the shoes because it's Bluetooth between the shoes because one's got the, the headset and the other's got the phone. Um, so my, my pair of shoes are uh, refusing to pair at the moment. So someone can have a, a go at that after. Um, but you know, that whole Maxwell Smart... like you know, Immediately, people know what a shoe phone is. And so you know, we put that out, we put a, a university press release out about making a shoe phone. Um, and credibility, you know, we thought, okay, what, what possible academic, world-benefiting use can a shoe phone have? Because ostensibly, uh, very little. Although I did discover it is actually easier in many cases to wear a shoe phone than to be like digging through your pockets to get a phone out. Um, still remember there was one day that um, we had a completely unrelated media event at the university that I was kind of helping out in the technical role. But I also had, I think, about half a dozen um, radio interviews to do on the shoe phone. So I was, I was literally wearing these things while I was going about my day. Um, and it was actually it's, it's really quick and easy to just, you know, they're non-laced, you just slip it off, you know, unclip the thing, pull the thing down, and, and like Maxwell Smart, you know, you're talking in no time at all. And you know, there's even one point where there was noise around and so I was, like, I was cowered in a corner by a door um, <laughs> trying to talk to someone in my shoe. Um, it was uh, very fun, certainly compared to writing droll de journal papers, it was um, immensely fun. So, um, yeah, cultural reference, if you can find a way to get it in there, um, will help you enormously. Uh, it's also why what we've done with the phones we've called the Serval Bat Phone. Because um, my strategy there is either people will think Batman and you know, the, the phone under the cheese um, serving lid, um, or perhaps someone will sue us because it's, we're infringing a trademark and we'll happily change the name in that case and put another media release out saying that we've had to change our name because um, someone's being nasty to us about the project and we'll get more free media. Um, so <laughs> if, if you think these things through in the, uh, the convoluted way that, uh, you know, that all publicity is good publicity, um, there's a whole pile of uh, really interesting things that you can do. The other lovely thing is that the media won't do what journal peer reviewers do. You know, you put something together that you know actually has dealt with all of the risks and all the issues involved in a piece of work. And then the, you know, the peer review comes in and says, oh, you really, you, you should run that on a, you know, an atom smasher in the CERN Institute to, to really prove that, you know, your program works reliably or whatever it is. And you go, where am I going to get $15 billion to put an atom smasher in? Um, with the media, they don't care. You, you actually get to set the story. Um, so it, it's just, I, I cannot speak too highly of using the media um, to your advantage. I've even been on a current affairs show without actually being chased down corridors by cameras, um, <laughs> which is uh, something that I'm strangely proud of and not at the same time. Um, so for Serval, the way that we looked at this, we thought, okay, let's demonstrate the key thing, calling from one mobile phone to another mobile phone with no supporting infrastructure. And you know, as I said, we could have done this in the car park at the back of the university. In fact, I do on a regular basis to show other people. But I thought, okay, to get the media to buy in, um, a little bit of hyperbole is actually quite good. And look, you know, when you watch that video, there's no question that you know, we've kind of you know, sneakily put SIM cards in the phones or done anything like that, because you know, you know, he's in the outback, he's wearing khaki. You know, it must be real. Um, so, you know, you can use that kind of uh, theatre to great effect. And, you know, the funny thing is, I, st I haven't actually published a single paper on this project. You know, this, this is the closest that I've actually come to date to actually having a, a publication on it. You know, a completely unlisted, unrefereed, whatever, journal paper, uh, sorry, conference paper. But it doesn't matter. Once that was out on TV and once it was on AM radio, no one doubts that we've done it. Um, no one can claim the academic space around this project from us because we can actually show on the public record that you know, on July the 12th, 2010, we were in the outback, we had a film crew on a, a PC-12 uh, PC aeroplane that we chartered and did all this fun stuff. Um, and there's not many other ways you get to charter an aeroplane in research work either unless you work in the right fields. Um, and so easily and on university money. Um, it was um, really good. So we, we set this thing up and then talk to and get to know your university media relations people. Um, they are your allies. Because anything that they see can, has the potential to raise the university's profile in the public eye and get it out there, um, they will tend to be very supportive of So they can do the press releases and things that you can then use to send out to all your favourite high-tech blogs and things. Um, I can't remember all the blogs that we got the shoe phone and the, the several stuff out onto. Um, but we got some pretty high-profile ones, partly because we had the press release. 
Um, and then in due course, if you play your cards right, you can get a, a crazy title out of a university as well. So I am Dr. Paul Gardner-Steven, Research Fellow in Rural, Remote and Humanitarian Telecommunications. Um, which <laughs> is great. Okay. Whenever I say that, I feel like King Julian off of Madagascar, you know, where he's being introduced by the other Lima with this, you know, blah, blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah, at the end with this enormously long title. Um, but that title lends credibility in a way that nothing much else can. Again, I have no publications in this area, but the university has bestowed upon me a crown that means that, you know, I can talk to, you know, to the federal government, the state government, I can, you know, we're talking to... Um, um, NGOs that work in disaster relief and all sorts of things. And the fact that I'm at a university and that you know, it's known and I have this wonderful title opens doors. And the reality, of course, is that we've actually done very little work. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> winding back, um, I mean, to the shoe phone, right? I made this as a, a prop for a church camp because um, I had like a, a Get Smart theme and I was on the organising committee and they, they pointed at me and said, you, you're an engineer, we want props. We want a shoe phone, we want a phone booth for people to disappear out the bottom of and we want a cone of silence. <laughs> and I sort of like had to sit there and go like, you know, no, I'm not an engineer. Um, people call me an engineer. Um, in fact, I think it, officially I actually am an engineer because I teach engineering students now, but um, the reality is I'm a, a computer scientist or more to the point a mad scientist. Um, but the, um, so I thought, okay, fine, like, you know, I, I can do techie stuff. So two weekends of mucking about with a, a family friend who was a cobbler and, you know, we made a pair, you know, a pair of shoes that is a shoe phone. Um, that was all the work that was really involved and, you know, a couple of hours of sitting down thinking, you know, you could use these things for remote medical monitoring. You know, you could work out if someone falls over wearing one of these. Um, so that's what we wrote into this press release. Um, that was the full extent of the work. <laughs> that was, you know, we literally did nothing else. Um, you know, and it was like a hundred bucks for all the bits and pieces. Down to cash converters to the pawn shop to get, you know, second-hand Bluetooth and find a, a phone that could actually tolerate being walked on. Um, and, you know, it, it went around the world. I mean, if you, if you search for shoe phone, those of you that look computers out there, um, you should find me fairly readily there. And you, if you do the image search in Google for shoe phone, you'll find a, you know, a crazy picture of me wearing probably the same khaki shirt and holding the, the phone next to my head. Um, and you know, we ended up, I think Discovery Canada ran a piece on it. Like, it was a very wacky time. Um, yeah, realshoephone.com. You can have a look at all sorts of fun pictures there as well. Um, but you know, sometimes the media doesn't come off, and you shouldn't be disappointed with that either. Um, so I thought I'd arrange what was a fantastic stunt. I wore these shoes from the time I stepped onto a plane in Adelaide Airport until I got off the plane in San Francisco post 9-11. You know, so I'm wearing shoes that have got electronic and wires that can feasibly look like a bomb. Um, you know, if you put it through a scanner, it shows it's got lithium polymer um, <laughs> you know, energy storage in there. And, you know, and this is like only a year after that guy had been busted for having allegedly you know, a bomb in his shoes. Um, but you know, a little bit of careful planning, I didn't go through any US security screening. I purposely chose to go from Australia into the US. And I thought, surely the media somewhere will care. No, they didn't. Um, and maybe with a bit more effort or the right contacts and the right luck, um, that would have worked better. Um, but you can do um, funky things. If you look at the real shoe phone .com, actually, there's a picture of me in a 747 um, holding the, the shoe phone to my head. Um, needless to say, in flight mode, in flight mode. Um, <laughs> but um, getting back, and I'm conscious that um, we're running out of time as well. Um, the real challenge of actually what we did was a teeny tiny little bit of code, lots of integration. If you work at a university um, and you kind of in software, and half of you guys probably have a number of these skills anyway, um, try and get yourself some work experience with a local sysadmin team um, and learn how to tame computers. Because once you can tame computers to do what you want, you can do anything. And indeed, you know, this project, the, actual, the programming part was less than three weeks, but it was four months of grinding away with a student to help me to try and get everything working. You know, asterisk into a mobile phone. Um, Android has a really weird linker environment. You know, it's compiling stuff. It's what you do as a sysadmin. Um, SIPDroid, the SIP client for the phone, was never designed to connect to a SIP server on the phone. Um, you know, we, we tried it and we're like, great, you know, this, this should all work fine. Heaps of work done for us. And, you know, and then SIPDroid says to me, you don't have a data connection. Um, I'm like, nah, what's loopback? Um, but, you know, 
it couldn't see a SIM card, so it, it didn't want to do anything. And so the, being able to nut your way through these little um, challenges is really helpful in research. Um, and I think I've probably done most of that part already, actually. Um, and that's probably all I actually want to say up front, but if anyone has any questions about running a, a research program in a university in an atypical way. Probably the other thing I should actually say is that all, all of this media coverage, um, so we got on the new inventors and that was very good. The university then invited me to a, um, they had a, a pitch day to basically say, oh look how good we are at research and gave 20 researchers three minutes to pitch their research. So I participated in that. I then buttonholed the right people in the university and four days later I had a three year um, research fellowship. Um, from the university, none of this waiting 18 months with the ARC and vagaries. So, you know, you can actually get the things that you want out of a research career through this path as well. Not right, right questions. Um, so, for the the um, media stunt part of your servo demonstration, mm -hmm. um, how certain were you that it was going to work? Um, at what point, when I was on the plane in the morning flying up, I was pretty certain it was going to work. Um, 48 hours prior to that, we hadn't actually got it working yet. Um, and I, I should actually, that was one of the anecdotes I, I did actually forget to mention. Um, we, had, we had it all planned out. There's a, um, a pilot in our department, and he was going to fly us up in a, a little four-seater Cessna. It was going to take like three or four hours to get up to Arcarola, do some filming during the day with a, a little handy cam. Um, overnight job, come back the next day and give the footage to um, the media and kind of work with it that way. Um, a few things happened. Um, the weather turned on us. We only had one day in which to do it. And we thought the Cessna cannot get there and back in one day. A visual flight rules in July, 10 hours of daylight. So that was when I had to, it was literally with four days to go that I had to scramble around and find four and a half grand to charter a jet. Um, and this is what I'm saying, marketing has much, much, much better economic parameters than research funding. Um, and so we found a, a jet and we were sitting down there and you know, taking off and there was a, a distinct moment of dread in the plane thinking I've organised this plane full of 10 people and film crews and all that kind of thing but very exhilarating and very fun. PC-12s take off in a really, really short distance. Um, it's an interesting experience. Yeah, the presenters want to swap around their laptops while we take more questions. Sure. Well, I'd like to uh, congratulate you on your uh, out-of-the-box thinking on getting your message out. I'm not in the academic world now. Mm -hmm. I am retired. But I knew all about your project. I've seen it on TV. I've read it in the paper. Congratulations. Thank you. Any other questions for Paul? Great. We've got one down the front here. Why did you choose to go the... Uh the academic path and, and, and not necessarily look for funding through a company? Uh, we're doing that too. Um, okay. I, I didn't mention it, like I'm based at Flinders University, um, but I also have several Project Inc. and I also have several Project Petrarchia Limited. And we basically, the university is for academic funding, the Inc. is for not-for-profit funding, the Petrarchia <laughs> Limited is for commercial funding. We are making the largest surface, um, like cross-section for funding to land on that we can possibly arrange. Was that, uh, sorry. Uh, was the university funding the first set of funding, or did you uh, have those? The university has provided the fellowship, but it's been at our own cost to set up those companies and pursue various things. We did actually get a, um, very fortunately, I spoke to the university and said, look, this is going to change the world. This has the potential to be a flagship project for the university. And we actually got the IP Meyer sorted out um, in a very interesting, gentlemanly way. We haven't quantified who owns how much of the IP, but the university has made clear that I am authorised to use all of the IP to engage in these various ways to the global good. Because um, getting universities to quantify how little they own of something, um, for it to be as little as you think they own, is um, something that takes years. So, yeah, you have to be shrewd, because universities are afraid of losing, so you need to offer them something much bigger than what they're afraid of losing. Right, are there any further questions for Paul? Right, well, if that's everyone, um, thank you, Paul, for your very entertaining talk.